Hello everyone, True Zero Emissions here. Okay, so this video is going to be a little bit longer. I'm not going to make a short video right now because I want to talk a little bit longer about this low resistance battery charging idea that I'm thinking about as a thought experiment, okay? Strictly as a thought experiment right now. Okay, let's talk about car alternators. Car alternators are creating pulses, right? Isn't it interesting that we're using... Basically, the, the car alternator, if I understand correctly, is an AC generator. Well, it's an AC pump. We're pumping AC from the environment. We're pumping energy into the... We're pumping energy from the environment in an alternating current way, right? AC, right? Not DC, right? It's not making DC. It makes AC. So what's the difference in making AC versus DC? We're not making it, though. We're, we're, I'm just going to say it that way, but we're really pumping it from the environment. Here's a thought. Let's compare six alternators wired in series that means each alternator adds the voltage of the previous one right i mean they add together right so the alternators are adding up the voltage right and the current would stay the same so the current would be equal to one alternator even though we have six the current would be the same of one the total output would be one right i'm calling it output wait a second what is current current's resistance Current amps is resistance. If we want low resistance battery charging, we don't want amps. We want potential. We want voltage. I think, right? This is the thought experiment. I'm just thinking, I'm working this out as I make this video right now. Uh, but it's something I want to talk about. So I thought, well, let's start rolling camera because that's when I, that's, that's my collaborator, right? Making the, the, the this is, like my journal. I'm literally writing in my journal right now, right? <clears throat> That's how I see the channel. That's why there's 10,000 videos on this channel. Because I make a lot of entries in my journal. <laughs> okay. If we don't want resistance to charge, we don't want we don't want we don't want to have resistance charging, right? Then would we want six alternators wired in parallel? or six alternators wired in series, if what I wanna do with those six alternators is charge a battery. So let's keep the one 12 volt battery, right? We, we have one 12 volt battery. And <clears throat> now obviously we can't really do this because the battery would explode probably putting this much energy into it. So this is just a thought experiment, right? I mean, we could hypothetically say the battery is like, uh, you know, we could say we have six batteries wired in parallel that way it's just one big capacity battery, right? So it's not just one little battery, right? So that would help a little bit. But, but well, we could just say one battery for now for the simplicity of this, just everything minimalism, right? So let's say we have one 12 volt battery and we're spinning these six alternators at the same exact speed and they're wired. Let's say all the alternators uh, do not have uh, diodes in them, because I think they do, I think they have diodes in there. Which, which change the AC into DC, right? But it's still, I think, going to be a pulsing DC. It's going to be pulses, right? Isn't that interesting? It's pulses. We could smooth that out with a capacitor, right? With, with like one of these, well, like a big capacitor. I don't know what big capacitors are right now, but that's actually an AC capacitor. But, you know, I have some big DC capacitors for car audio. Oh, they're back there. Those are pretty big capacitors right there. That would probably smooth that pulse out. But you know what? I want pulses. I want pulses because, because I do. I want pulses. Look, these are pulses right here. Look at these pulses charging my battery. See these pulses right here? Negative energy oscillator. I don't know what frequency it is, but it's charging my battery. I'm at 23.6 volts with these two batteries wired in series. They're cold. Everything's cold. I had the fan running too, so. We have about 18 volt, uh, probably about between 16 and 18 volts going into this at uh, I think 350 milliamps. And hopefully you can hear me because that fan is going to make noise on this microphone. So I think that's putting about 350 milliamps into that. And we don't want to exceed half an amp right there. Right? Input. Okay, so. So car alternators, right? There's a car alternator right there. That's an alternator right there. That's an alternator right there. 
I have a lot of alternators. I was collecting them because I want to do experiments. See, I have a couple over there. Is there any more over here? So there's two there, and then, oh, there's some up here. There's one there. Okay, that's an alternator. So we have three over there all together. And then uh, we have this one here, and then I have a couple in the kitchen. So now that these make AC, they don't make, right? But we're just going to say they AC comes out of them. They pump it from the environment, right? That's a DC motor, brushed motor. So that's going to pump DC, direct current, right? Which is a different kind of energy. So we can charge a battery with that, but we can charge a battery with this if we convert it to DC first by running it through diodes. Or we can also use a full wave grid rectifier, which I have down here. Those are little, these are little full wave, these are full wave bridge rectifiers. Uh, probably 250 volts. Um, uh, 50 amps, 40 or 50 amps, if I recall correctly. So that would be enough, right? Oh yeah, and I have a bunch in here. Uh, I forgot that I picked up, I picked some up here. I keep forgetting that I have these. That's why I pick. I bought these. I bought these. Those are all full wave bridge rectifiers. And the reason I picked those up is because I want to do this experiment I'm talking about with you. Now I'm talking about using alternators and running them in series to charge a battery. Now here's a question I'm going to ask you. <clears throat> what has less resistance? If we're charging a 12 volt battery, right? A car battery. We'll say a big, a, big, a big battery for a car. If I'm charging that battery with six alternators wired in parallel, right? Parallel. That means all the pluses are connected to all the pluses. And all the positives are connected to the, all the positives. And then all the pluses from the alternators go to the plus of the battery. And all the minuses on the alternators go to the minus of the battery to charge that battery, right? Now that's going to add up. When we were in parallel, that adds up the current, it adds up the amps. Amps are resistance. Amps and current are resistance, right? Now, I could be totally wrong about what I'm saying right now. This is a thought experiment, but I think there's something to what I'm saying right now. There definitely is to me. I just don't know where this is going. It might lead to an experiment that proves I was completely wrong. But guess what? That's okay, and I'm really excited about what I'll learn as long as I don't get hurt. And I have to be careful, right? That's the main thing. And what's our indicator of being safe? Temperature. So if we see temperature rising, we need to stop, right? That's what I do. That's what I do. I, I don't want things getting hot. If the battery's getting hot, then I, there's some, something needs to change. So if I was doing running six alternators in parallel, that's going to give us more current, but the same voltage, right? So the voltage would be the same as one alternator, but the current would add up on all of them. We'd add the amps up. But if we want low resistance, we want low current, right? High potential, we want to get that voltage of the battery to go up quick, right? So let's say that our 12 volt battery is depleted. Let's say it's totally drained, right? And we want to charge it up fast, right? So we want to charge it as fast as possible. Um, if we charged it with six alternators wired in parallel and did a test and saw, read the temperature of the, at the, at, so the alternator spinning at the same RPM for both tests, right? So whatever that RPM is, like a good RPM range, we could probably say like 2,000 RPMs maybe, uh, 1,000 or 1,500 RPMs, 2,000 RPMs each. So whatever we decide on for RPM, meaning how fast the alternator spin, to match it on both tests. So one test is the alternators are all wired in parallel and, and then charge the battery up and see it, read the temperature of the battery, how quick the temperature increases, things like that. Then wire all the alternators in series. Now, how does that work? Okay, so if the alternators don't have any diodes in them, right? Let's say we just have the signals coming out of there, the two wires coming out. And I run those two wires into a full wave bridge rectifier from each alternator. I go into a full wave bridge rectifier. Okay, you know, I did this before when I ran four alternators on a scooter. I didn't understand what was happening in that test, but I know that when those alternators were spinning, the voltage would climb really fast. And I'm like, what's happening? I don't understand what's happening. And I was, I was actually nervous about what I was doing. And I thought, let me come back to this at a later date because I don't know if the batteries are going to explode or what's going to happen. Now I understand that if the batteries are going to do something, they're going to give me a warning. They're gonna, there's going to be some gas coming off, right? They'll, they'll, there'll be some bubbles, gas, or temperature will increase or all the above right so that now i know that but back then when i saw voltage jump up 
when I was running four alternators in series, I go, oh no, uh, it's the volt how did the voltage go up instantly? And I thought, I'm not going to risk this. It's interesting, take notes. Okay, noted. But I didn't know what was happening. And I didn't want to uh, risk, you know, getting injured at that time. This was many years ago. That video is on the channel, and this is from many years ago when I was running four alternators on a scooter. But I was having some technical difficulties with the bar that was connecting all the alternators together was breaking because of the way I had the alternators connected together with one shaft. Um, so I would have had to find a different way to connect the alternators together. But I left that project because I felt that I was happy with what I saw, but I didn't know what I was, what it meant, what I saw. So now let's say revisit this idea and we'll add a couple alternators. So we have six alternators now wired in series. So the way that would work is all the alternators have wires coming out of them. Let's say they have two wires coming out. Those two wires go to full wave bridge rectifiers, which we just saw over there, which are about $2.50 each. Uh, last time I checked, they could be a little more now. And then uh, they have them on Amazon, they have them on the internet. Uh, many places sell full wave bridge rectifiers, probably 50, 50 amps at 250 volts at least, but the voltage could even be higher since we don't know how high the voltage is going to go. We're going to go. Now, even though it's a 12 volt battery, this thought experiment is considering the possibility of using really high voltage spikes. Now a spike, I'm talking about a wave, right? So it may not be a perfect like spike like that, like John Bedini, where you have these sharp spikes going up. It might be more like a wave, right? You know, it might be like a square wave. I don't know what the I don't know what that wave would look like coming out of the full wave bridge rectifier. Does that make it a square wave? I don't know actually. So I don't have an oscilloscope. I need to get one. That's an essential tool to have. And a lot of people were telling me, get one of those, get one, get one, you need one. Well, I can definitely see why, because that's gonna be useful for this for electrical engineering, right? So um I have inquired about them. I just didn't uh I haven't um purchased one yet. I was looking at used ones as well. So uh the journey continues for a search for an oscilloscope. I think that's what it's called, oscilloscope. Okay, so to show us those waves, right? What do, those, what do the waves look like? Okay, so six alternators wired in series. The way it would wire in series, I think, is through the bridge rectifiers wiring, the, wiring those in series, right? Um, and at the moment, I'm not recalling how that looks, but I could go back to the, one of my videos and see that. I also drew it out. Uh, and how to wire it. That's the way I think I wired it before. So having all the bridge rectifiers in series, and that would add up the voltage, or we can call it add up the potential, I guess, of all the alternators. Now, if we spin those alternators at the same speed that we were spinning them previously in the first test with all the wire, alternators wired in parallel, and we charge, we have six alternators spinning at 1,000 RPMs or 1,500 RPMs or 2,000 RPMs, whatever we choose on, and then we have that going to our 12 volt battery and i'm thinking right now that i would probably want to go very low on the rpms i don't want those alternators putting out a lot of pumping a lot of pressure into that battery right because i don't want to accident so i would go low on the rpms i think and i think the first test would probably be a, a the series test right so where i have all the alternators wired in series so the first test would be all the alternators wired in series and then I would choose an RPM so the voltage isn't too, too high. I don't want like hundreds and hundreds of volts or thousands of volts right away. Not right away. Now, I know Thomas Bearden talked about 300,000 volt negative energy spikes. But when we're talking about that, I don't know if we're talking about something that has a lot of magnet or iron or copper wire interacting with the environment. Because I think the more that we have, the more magnetic field we have, the more coil that we have, which, which generates a magnetic field when we, when we put potential to it, when we put electricity to it, right? Or when we move it past magnets, right? Now remember, these magnets and copper are interacting with the zero point field at all times. Zero point field is absolutely filled with energy. It's surprising that electrodynamics seems to completely ignore that, that the magnets and the copper wire exist in an energy rich environment. And I'm talking about, when I talk about energy rich, we're talking about infinite energy, literally infinite energy. So we could say megawatts in the area of the tip of my finger, but that would be entirely wrong because it's actually all the energy in the universe because all the universe is interconnected instantaneously. Okay, so just study particle physics to learn more about that. So here's what I'm thinking though. If we charge the battery in these two different ways with alternators, what does the battery do? 
is it run, is the battery charged faster when the when the when the alternators are in series? Now here's the important thing: is stopping the, the charge, stopping the alternators in time. So once that voltage gets where we want it, then stopping, right? Now when I say that, if I was doing the test, and let's say I run the alternators, and let's say the voltage, I'm just doing a thought. This is just purely a thought experiment. I'm hypothesizing right now. If the voltage went up high, right? For example, we know that like 13, 14 volts is considered full for a lead acid battery, right? It's considered full. But let's say the voltage went to like 20 volts. But then when I stopped the alternators, the voltage dropped down to 10 or 9, right? Real, real low. So in that case, I would not consider that the battery full yet. That would not be, to me, that would not be full. So therefore, as long as the battery's not heating up, I'd probably proceed with the experiment and see what it does. What I'm trying to say is, I'm not letting high voltage stop me from proceeding with the experiment. What will stop me from proceeding is heat. If I see the battery getting hot or boiling, now I know there can be cold bubbles, right? The battery can boil like a cold bubble. Uh, John Bedini talked about that. The battery could be bubbling, but it's cold. Uh, and I don't know if he called them cold bubbles or not, but I'm just saying that right now. I'm just saying a cold bubble, right? It's not, the battery's not heating up. The plates aren't getting hot, but it's bubbling. What's happening? I don't know what's happening. Is that hydrogen? I don't know. Um, but I'm thinking right now about low resistance battery charging, right? So now, just as a thought experiment, purely as a thought experiment. Oh, this video is going to take like a week to upload. We're already at 16 minutes. I shot a video several days ago that was like 10 minutes long. It's been loading for like three days. So I'm really sad to think that you guys aren't really going to be able to hear this video for like a week probably. <laughs> Uh, I could have live streamed it though, but then I didn't know if it's going to glitch or uh, or miss some of the words I say because that happens sometimes. Anyway, I'll make some shorts that talk about this too. But I just wanted to work this out once with not with not stopping and stopping every minute and doing short videos. But I'll do I'll do that after I do this. I'll do some short videos that way you'll hear you'll hear this. So um, uh, so just uh, as a thought experiment with the scooter with King GTR right. This is the scooter. Now imagine this scooter, now I don't think there's any, I don't know how I'd connect alternators to this, but let's just say we have six alternators running on the scooter, right? Maybe it has some wheels underneath the scooter that are pushing against the ground, and when those wheels, or wheel, when there's one wheel that spins, it turns a gear that spins all these other alternators, right? So we have all these alternators spinning, and let's say that the output, now I'm going to say it the way that everybody loves. Because when we talk about charging the same battery that's powering the scooter, that's uh, very unpopular for electrical engineers, right? They're like, oh, you don't want to charge the same battery that you're discharging, even though we do it for cell phones, right? We're using our phones when they're plugged in. And sometimes they get warm, but they get warm anyway. They get warm just using them, right? I don't know if they get more warm when we're using them and charging them at the same time. But a lot of people have said, you can't do that. You can't charge a battery and discharge it at the same time. And then we're like, well, cars do it. And then people are like, no, you don't. The car is not doing it. The alternator is running all the accessories. The car, the battery just charges the, the, uh, the battery just runs the starter when you turn the car on. But I still think it's interesting that we're not using a DC, a DC generator to charge the battery on a car. We're using these pulses. We're using an AC. That's an AC. An alternator makes AC. And we convert the AC to DC, but it's still pulsing DC. And I think that's interesting. Because to me, when I look at a car, I see a battery that is running the lights and running accessories, but also being charged at the same time, just like a cell phone is being used the same time it's often being charged at the same time as well, right? So I'm just noticing, I'm just taking note, mental notes to myself, that yes, we kind of are using pulses, right? AC is a pulse. You know, so when Cameron asked me, what if we plug the wall directly into the battery and put all that power in there? Now, he didn't say it just that way. He said, you know, could the battery handle it? And what kind of batteries could handle it? Well, I just saw some, uh, I think there's a company called Rumble, Rum Rumble, they have a Rumbler. I think it's a Rumbler e-bike. Uh, they have a battery that can be charged at 80 amps. It's a graphene battery, I think, a graphene capacitors. Now, I heard about that technology like 15 years ago from aerospace engineers. Um, I just wrote about this recently. I was saying that I was sitting at a dinner table with a, a table full of aerospace engineers. These guys were involved with the biggest projects you could think of. And 
and can't think of too. And they were saying that graphene is the technology today. It's here. It's the future today. And this was 15 years ago. Where is it? Where's graphene? Well, this small company, I'm saying small. I don't know how big they are. Maybe they're big. These, this, the, the Rumble bike, the Rumble e-bike, they, they are making their own battery. Can you believe this? These guys are making their own battery. I think that's my understanding. I'm pretty, they're, maybe they're having a company make it for them, but they're, they're, they're making their own battery. I'm going to say it that way. I don't know if, if they're having it made you know, or, or how it works, all the details, but this battery can be charged at 80 amps. They show a battery being charged in like, I forgot how long it took. Uh, was it 20 minutes or 30 minutes to 100% charge for what, a 20 amp hour? I forgot what the amp hour was. But look, I mean, I'm like, I was also like, wait a second, that sounds great, but this battery, if I charge this battery in this scooter at 10 amps, it could charge like just over three hours. If I put 15 amps in it, can I get that down to like two hours? And let me ask you this, can I charge it in a low resistance way? So I'm really excited about the battery technologies improving where they can charge faster and faster. Uh, we're never gonna hear the end of people saying that, that charging fast uh, hurts the battery, but to me, it's like people saying you can't fly an airplane. It'd be like someone saying you can't fly an airplane. I mean, how long did they say that? Did, was it overnight? Like, when did people stop saying you can't fly a plane? Was it when the first plane flew? You know, because like 100 years ago, or I don't know exactly how many years ago it was now. Uh, I don't know exactly how many years it's been, but everyone believed that an airplane can't fly, even though they saw birds flying. You know, if you read papers and research back in the time period before the airplane flew, that kind of thinking of something can't be done and that's 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 it looks like that with fast charging batteries and people are doing it g batteries who i talk about all the time and uh i mean what does it take for people to, to be like yeah oh they did it whoa i mean that company g batteries they were getting scientists from all over the world calling them calling them scammers hoaxers calling them names cursing at them saying they should be ashamed of themselves saying all these negative things to them when they first started out and saying there's no way people have been doing this and they all turned out to be scammers in the past. That's what they told them, right? You think that company stopped? You think G batteries stopped doing what they're doing? They were getting people telling them it's already been tried, it's been done, it hurts the battery. Well, G batteries is getting longer cycle life out of fast charging than slow charging does, right? And where have I heard that before? FMA Direct Cell Pro Power Lab 8. That company's been around for, for around the same time. Um, they had a product, I think, far long before G batteries did. And I, I don't know that they're using the same approach, but I do know that they're able to charge batteries, small batteries, really, really fast. That's, uh, that's the Cell Pro Power Lab 8. They have V2 out now, I think, if I recall correctly. And I didn't try calling the company again. I used to talk to them a lot years ago um, about the, the, the Cell Pro Power Lab 8. And um, <clears throat> it was all about how they charge it, you know. And... We have to do our own research, you know. We can't, like my teachers would say, being spoon-fed. We can't just be spoon-fed. If we do that, it's going to severely limit what we think about and what we're aware of and what, how, what we think of as being possible, right? And we certainly are not going to ask for something that we don't think is possible, right? And it's all about asking for the things that we need, not for the things that we think can be done. Because anything can be done. What do you need? It's going to get, we'll find a way, right? That's the universe we live in, particle physics. Anything is inevitable. Anything is inevitable. Anything, right? So anyone that thinks you can't run a car on water, what do you think gasoline is? It's water. Hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon, right? I mean, those are the things that make it work. Uh, is the hydrogen and the oxygen is what makes it work. That's water. And then carbon doesn't do anything. So why are we putting gasoline in the engine that's causing all these problems, all these health problems, when water's a better fuel and it's actually a fuel? Gasoline's not a fuel. I don't know what it is. It's carbon with some water in it. <laughs> uh, or it's water with carbon in it. I mean, I don't know how you want to say it. So, so it's like contaminated water, right? Contaminated with, contaminated with, with uh, carbon. Whereas water, just water, doesn't have any contamination in it. Okay, so thinking about low resistance battery charging. So with that said, this is where I get, I slow down, is where I'm like, okay, now how do I actually attach something to the scooter? How do I actually attach an alternator to the scooter, right? 
And do I want to? Do I want to put like alternators all over the scooter? I don't really know. I want to start putting alternators on this. <laughs> you know? Um, how do I do the test? How do I do the experiment? Maybe I just have to do it on a bench. Maybe I just have to line up six alternators on a bench and connect everything together with chains, like motorcycle chains or something strong, and then have like a, a motor, right? A motor spinning the alternators have the alternators all wired in series and do the test that way. I don't know, it seems like I like thinking about things like a thought experiment, thinking it through, and then what I choose and how I choose to do the experiment, maybe that's interesting to me, but it's not a top priority the way that thinking about things is. Like thinking things through and, and creating ideas with thought experiments, it seems to be like that's a big, there's an urgency there, like an excitement to it. Like I really enjoy that. The actual making of things is, uh, I am excited about it, but maybe I'm just like, you know, I mean, I have the alternators here. I have a bunch of, these all are kind of like alternators too. These are uh, lawnmower motors and those make AC as well. So I guess I could connect those somehow to something. I could wire six of those in series. And um, how could I connect that to the scooter if I was to connect it to the scooter though? I mean, I guess I could put like, could I put a sprocket right here? and then run a chain to that. I don't know if I'd want to do that, you know? I mean, the scooter's like really made the way it is and it's really good the way it is. And it seems like it'd be better to make something like on a bench, you know, where it just runs on the bench. But then, then I think, oh, but I want to be able to use it like on, like on something like a motorcycle or a bicycle or, or, you know, something I can use like for transportation, right? So maybe like an electric car, right? So if I have an electric car, now that would be an interesting experiment, right? If I have an electric car and I put six alternators on it, I wire the six alternators in series, and then I, I connect that, those series, that voltage, into the battery system of the car, right? Now how do I do that? Do I run... I don't even know if I finished my thought that I was saying on this. I'm, I'm there again right now. I'll talk about this and the car. So on the electric car, do I have a second battery that I charge while the car is being, you know, running off of the one battery? And then with the scooter, if I was running alternators on it or these little motors that I'm going to, that if I use those motors as generators, right, into a full wave bridge rectifier, right? Because these have three wires coming out. So then I would use a full wave bridge rectifier like, like, uh, like these. See these? These are from Amazon. I got them on Amazon. See how there's three wires? So this will take th those three wires that come out of those motors. Those motors are uh, have AC coming out. That goes in, AC in, DC out, plus and minus. So those would go to the... Uh, well, if I was going in series, I'd have to figure out how to wire all that in series. Um, these just have two in and two out, right? AC in and AC uh, DC out. But... On the scooter, using one battery, have one battery running the scooter and one battery charging. But then on an electric car, we don't have like a lot of room to run a whole second big battery, right? So what if I just ran six alternators and then ran those, that high voltage potential in back into that, into that, the battery. The thing is, I have to be able to watch temperature. I have to be able to watch the voltage. I mean, it, it feels like there's a lot of risks involved, right? I guess I have to be willing to destroy the car. Like, it, literally, it's an experimental car. It becomes an experimental car where it could destroy itself in the experiment. And I have to accept that that's, that's what I'm looking at. But if, if it purely in a thought experiment, it would be neat to have the alternators. Uh, there's a car on, on, on YouTube. I think it's called the Forever Car. I don't know how you find it. I made a playlist of it. But uh, I think I call it Self-Charging Electric Car or unlimited range electric car, but it's a red car, it's a convertible, I think, if I recall correctly, it had fans all over it, like, it had these fans, and behind each fan blade was an alternator, so this thing had like 30 alternators on it, right, I, I think, approximately, I don't remember how many it had, but it had alternator on the back wheel, each back wheel, I don't know if it had one on the front wheels, but, and then it had many fan blades spinning alternators, so as you drive it, these, these, al these alternators were spinning, and they were topping off the batteries, they were keeping the batteries charged, now, could, did the batteries, 
stay charged enough, did that act as a range extender? They called it the forever car, which to me kind of implies that it was it was able to pump enough energy from the environment, which is where all energy comes from, right? Because there's no energy created ever. Even the power plant doesn't make energy. It's pumping it from the environment. You know, you know, electrodynamics, there's people that are really good at electronics, right? Really, really good. My understanding of the mastery of electronics is is purely electrodynamics, if I understand correctly. I could be wrong, but that's my impression, is that we, that's called electrodynamics. And it's interesting to watch some of the people in electronics make things, and there's some pretty famous people that, that, are, uh, that are teaching electronics on the Internet, and they like to do fun experiments and things, but they make fun of free energy, and they might make fun of... Uh, they might make fun of um, anyone that talks about having efficiency greater than 100%. And I don't know if they realize, right? I don't know if they realize that, that because I've just read a lot more books. I don't just read electrodynamics, right? I started there, so I read several hundred books on, on circuits and stuff. But that was just the beginning. Then I started running, reading particle physics, and I started reading everything else, including how the universe works. So I didn't just stop just at how circuits work. Now, if I just read how circuits work, I guess I, would, I might think that we make energy. I don't know. But I don't see how someone could know because we were all taught that you can't make energy. So how could we all know that you cannot make energy and then you have these master electrical engineers somehow seeming to think, I guess, I mean, you tell me or tell yourself or tell them, they seem to think that we can make energy because a circuit claims... Our traditional circuits do not acknowledge the energy in the environment at all. I'm talking about the Richard Feynman energy, the John Wheeler energy, and the hundreds of other people, thousands of other engineers, uh, theorists and, and electrical engineers that understand the bigger picture of particle physics and how it relates to our circuits and how the energy is interacting with our circuits at all times. So it's important to see the bigger picture, right? To, so it's like in movies, we have the close-up, the medium shot that shows a little bit more information. Then we have the wide shot that shows everything, right? And it seems like in, in electrodynamics, people are kind of stuck in the microscopic, just focused on that one part or that one circuit and not even looking at the environment at all. And if you look at everything, it becomes clear that, well, to me, it became clear that, oh... It looks like when they're making fun of of anything over 100% efficiency, what they're actually seeming to claim is that the only energy that exists in a circuit is the energy that's created at the power station and sent down the wires and delivered to the house or the energy that's stored in the battery that was put there by a generator that made the energy and pumped it into the battery and then the battery uses this energy, right? But what actually is happening is the power station is sending a signal. It's not making any energy at all. It's just sending a signal. I mean, we can call the signal energy, but it's what it's really we're doing is releasing the energy that's at our homes in, in our environment, right? Because it's more efficient to do that, right? Nikola Tesla. Our power grid is designed, if I understand correctly, it was invented by Nikola Tesla. That's why we're using his technology. But there's this story that, oh, we would have had free power if, Tes if Nikola Tesla's inventions were, were given to us. What we don't realize is that all of Nikola Tesla's inventions are being used right now, and we pay for free energy. What I mean is, I understand that it costs money, free energy costs money, just like solar costs money, right? The solar is free energy, but it costs. Well, the power coming through the wires is free energy, but we're paying for it. But I think a lot of free energy inventors and experimenters are, are thinking, well, why pay for that signal to come to the house when I could generate my own signal and release the same energy that, that, they're, that they're releasing by sending a signal to my house, right? So um, uh, I think that's, you know, everything I'm saying is a thought experiment. I don't know for sure, 100%. I just, it's thought experiment, right? It's just from reading, thinking about things, and trying to have a perspective that's a, that's basically uh, an accumulation of all the information that I've that I've studied and, and I'm trying to put this puzzle together, right? So if you like puzzles, you'll love you'll love particle physics and that collaboration between particle physics and electrodynamics. 
electrodynamics, the circuits that we have in our homes and our, in our circuits and everything electrical, and then particle physics, which is the circuitry of the universe, right? The wireless circuitry of the universe, right? The 99.99% 99 empty space of the material universe, right? <laughs> like all material universe is a material universe is 99.99% empty space, right? So uh, in ma the ma material universe itself is pure energy, right? E equals mc squared. What does that mean? It's that is a description of the amount of energy it, cre it takes to create matter. E equals mc squared. This, I read this, right? Now I'm paraphrasing. This is the way I interpreted what was being said. Uh, I'll have to share some of the books I've read with you. I, I've shared them in the past, but I'll share them again. I don't, I don't have the titles memorized. But uh, E equals, you ever, have you ever heard E equals MC squared as, have you ever heard it explained as, or, or have you ever heard it said that that's an equation that describes how much energy it takes to create matter? Right? That's neat. <laughs> it's like, how do you use the energy in the universe to create the material universe? And then you realize that the material universe sustains the pure energy universe, which is like the space between the, the space, the empty space that's, that is the material universe, you know. <laughs> I think I said that right. The space that is the material universe, right? The zero point field. So uh, anyway, this video, when I started, I just wanted to talk about... At, kind of like this idea of charging something with high voltage versus high current. Now, if current is resistance, it literally is comes from resistance. It's just a, it's an indicator of resistance, right? And if we don't want to charge batteries with resistance, if we want to charge batteries with low resistance, then just purely as a thought experiment, what if we took like 100 alternators or 1,000 alternators, right? 1,000 alternators. That's too many, but I'm just saying, just the thought experiment. A thousand alternators, all wired in series, and then charged, you know, some really, really big batteries with that, right? Versus a thousand alternators all wired in parallel, right? So let's say the voltage of the battery, this huge, enormous battery, is the size of a building, right? This is all hypothetical. This is just a thought experiment. If the battery is the size of a big building, and it's like the battery is like two volts, it's a two volt battery, right? Well, so it's even a lead acid battery. It's a lead acid two volt battery. And we have a thousand alternators wired in parallel, spinning at 2000 RPMs. So we have our battery the size of a building that's two volts. And we charge it with this thousand alternators wired in parallel, which is gonna give us not a lot of voltage, but a lot of current, right? So would that charge the battery faster and would the battery charge up cooler or hotter compared to those thousand batteries wired in series charging that two volt battery the size of a building, right? Two volt battery the size of a building, thousand alternators, all wired in series. So now we have super, super high voltage and we have the current of only one alternator. So whatever the alternator can put out current-wise, like 30 amps or less, that's it. 30 amps, 1,000 alternators. But the voltage could be, you know, thousands, right? Thousands of volts to charge that 2-volt battery. Now, again, I don't want to overcharge the battery. So if the battery's at like half a volt and it's depleted and 2 volts is fully charged, lead acid battery, okay? I'm just, this is all thought experiment only. Strictly thought experiment. I, I don't want to get that voltage up past the two volts. I mean, it maybe maybe three volts max, right? Because even a 12 volt lead acid car battery is considered full when it's at like 13.4 volts or 14.4 volts, is it? I don't know exactly where, but like one or two volts over more than 12 volts, we call it a 12 volt battery, but it's full when it's like 13 or 14 could be considered full, right? Especially if it's just been charged or when it's, when it's being filled up, it could be at 14 volts, right? I've seen that and I've read about that but I don't know what the official proper number is for it being full once the charger's removed from it, right? So when the charger's disconnected and the battery's considered full, is it at 13.8 volts or 14.3 volts? Something around there. So it's just a thought, okay? Now, another thought I have, and this video is super long, it's already almost 40 minutes, 
But I'm trying to just share these thoughts. So I'm thinking about this, and I'm, this is my journal, right? This the video is my journal, literally. I'm just thinking out loud, and, and then I can listen to it and think about it more. Um, so, hang on, let me do something real quick. I'm gonna make sure my phone doesn't get any interruptions. Okay, good. Uh, I was just uh, putting my phone on. Uh, do not disturb and I was hoping that wouldn't stop the video because if someone calls me while I'm talking in the video it pauses the video and then I have to make a separate video so uh, let me think about this okay so we're talking about low resistance charging okay this is the next thing I wanted to talk about with that so since we know that copper and magnets that's the two things we use right in electric motors and generators and um, uh, I think battery chargers I mean, can you have a battery charger without having copper coil and without having iron? I don't know. It's, I think those are required, but I don't know for sure, right? I have to study this. I'm going to have to study battery charging again. I've done it before. I've, been, I've read books on battery charging. It's been a long time, and I just don't recall the details at the moment. So I have to read some more electrical engineering on how is a battery charger made? Now, I'm thinking about G batteries, right? G batteries, electrical engineers, father and son, I think they're both electrical engineers, and they were experimenting with how many different ways can we charge a cell phone battery. They, they didn't have a goal of trying to fast charge a battery. That, that happened, I'll call it an, a, a happy accident, but originally it was just how can we charge a battery in a different way? Now, I'm trying to think about that, and I want to do that. I want to try to charge a battery in a different way. I've already done it. You've, a lot of you have seen me have batteries all across the floor, covering the whole floor almost in batteries where I'm charging them all, right? And I'm using batteries to charge batteries and I'm sending the energy back and forth and back and forth and the batteries are getting rejuvenated while I do that, right? Just by splitting the positive and splitting the negative. And they both seem to work, right? So high voltage on one side, parallel on this side, Negative connected from this set to this set and then positive going through a motor, right? And as that motor spins, which is that's free energy, right? Because that motor's spinning for free. The work that motor does is free and all the power goes through that motor through a one wire positive or negative choose one as the voltage from this higher voltage set of batteries goes to this lower set of voltage of batteries, right? So I did many many tests of that many many experiments with that. It was a lot of fun and uh, um, and so so now I lost my train of thought, but I'm going to go back to because I think I was trying to relate that to this idea of do we need copper and do we need magnets to charge batteries, right? So yes, and then the, and then the G batteries, the father and son who started the company, and, but who began in their garage or their basement. Uh, I don't know if it was the garage or basement. I, it may have been basement, but basically a workshop at home where they were just trying different ways of charging batteries. Now I'm thinking about this and all of us can do this at home. Wouldn't that be great? All of us could do this. We could all experiment with different ways of charging batteries. And I, I don't know for sure, but it's my impression that, we're, that, that high voltage spikes are being used. Now what's a spike? That could be infinite different things. I'm not, this is not an answer that I have. I don't have an answer. But when I say spike, what does the spike look like on an oscilloscope? It would an oscilloscope even show me what's actually doing the charging? Would it even show me that? Right? Because it's just two-dimensional. It's not, I don't think it's three-dimensional. Do they have three-dimensional oscilloscopes? Do they have four-dimensional oscilloscopes? What would that look like? So how many dimensions can we go on the oscilloscope? How much can we see? How much information can we see of the wave, right? Because a wave has infinite information, infinite time, infinite space, infinite energy. One wave has infinity of time, space, energy, and information. One wave has all that. So how do we use a wave to charge a battery? And one wave can charge a battery, <laughs> but how do we do it? What does it look like? Okay, everyone, True Zero Emission signing off. I'm gonna make a thousand short videos now describing what we just talked about in this one uh, 44 minute video. See you in the next video, everyone. Have a great day.